So we are starting a new series today called Searching for Christmas, Searching for Christ at Christmas. That's why the Christ is all caps. So what we wanted to do is to take some time and look at some of the religions around us, not just in our world, but in our neighborhoods, in our relationships, and not to look at them with a critical eye, but just to look at them with an eye towards Jesus. That's why we're thinking about Jesus. See, the thing about religion is that all people and all time have sought something bigger and better. We all have quested to be saved from this predicament we find ourselves in. We know and we sense that there's someone or something bigger and better than what we're in the midst of. And then, so we seek religion. So each religion has that salvation element into it. And a lot of religions have elements of Jesus in their religion. So what we want to do is take a look at different religions and look for the Jesus that they talk about and the Jesus that we talk about, the Jesus that we depend on, because we know and we believe that Jesus is the ultimate salvation bringer. So today we're going to learn a little bit about Mormonism, the Jesus of Mormonism versus the Jesus of the Bible. I invite my friend Josh to come back. He has a great message for us and a great story as his wife shares with him. So welcome, Josh. Thank you, Carlisle. This has um, been a great time. It's a great time sharing the first service, and here we are now. And um, I am excited, um, number one, because it's Christmas time. When I walked in here and I saw the Christmas trees and everybody dressed festively, and then the kids singing, it was, um, it's, it's great. It's really the Christmas spirit. But it is an honor to be here. I was here a couple weeks ago, and Pastor Carlisle asked me back, and, um, and I said, yeah, of course. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. He's like, oh, but bring your wife along, too, because we want her to speak, too. Um, we're going to be talking about Mormonism today. We're going to be talking about the Latter-day Saint Church and how they view Christianity, or excuse me, how they view Jesus Christ. Because we realize that when we engage in conversation with some of our friends, maybe even some of our relatives who are of the LDS Church, that they talk about some of the same things. But a lot of times they mean vastly different things. They define things differently. They define terms differently. And what I want to do is I want to bring a little bit of clarity to that. And so we're going to be talking about the Jesus of Mormonism, or the Jesus of the Latter-day Saint Church, versus the Jesus of biblical Christianity. And then after that, you know, I've been put in a, in a little bit of a unique situation because my wife was in the Mormon Church. For about 12 years. And so she's going to tell her story of what it was like to enter into the Mormon church, what it was like, her experience about that, and how she met Jesus and how that, how she decided to leave the Mormon church and choose, choose the Jesus of biblical Christianity. So we're going to share that. So that's a special treat for you, and it's always for me. But before we get started, let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for um, what you have to share with us today. And so Lord, we come before you, and we come with open hearts and open minds, and, and we are ready to learn what you have to teach us today. Be with me as I speak, and um, that your words would speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've talked a little bit about having meaningful conversations, and realize that when we're talking about this, we, we really want to have respect, and we want to have dignity for our, um, share dignity, and, and exude dignity for our LDS community, because uh, in my personal situation, I have extended relatives who are who are still in the LDS church, and so we in no way want to, to demean or, or do anything like that. What we want to do is, is clearly articulate what, what the Mormon church believes about who Jesus is, and using some references from their scriptures and from their prophets, and then also help you to understand clearly what and then from that, be able to make a decision for yourself. So with that, there's one question. There's a couple of items that, that I'd actually like to address today. And the first one is the person of Jesus. Maybe you guys know this story in the Bible in Luke 8 or 9. In Luke 9, it talks about Jesus being with his disciples. And as he's been doing ministry and miracles, he comes to his disciples and he says, Who do people say that I am? And the main thrust of that, or one of the things that we can pull from that conversation that Jesus had with them, it's not, it's not just important to know that Jesus existed. But 
but it is essential that we know who Jesus actually is. And the LDS Church, this is what they believe about who Jesus is. Jesus was a man who became a God. Jesus was a man who became a God. Their current president, or their current apostle for the Mormon Church, his name is Russell Nelson. And this is what he gives, and he gives a passage in the Book of Mormon about this to explain this. But this is what he says to verify this fact. He says, that Jesus attained perfection following his resurrection is confirmed in the Book of Mormon. So what he's saying is, is that Jesus was not perfect before. But he had to go through life and perfectly fulfill all the laws and ordinances of, of the Mormon God. And once he resurrected from the dead, then he then he became God. And he continues on and he says this. It records the visit in the resurrected, in the resurrected of our resurrected Lord, rather, to the people in ancient America. This is from the Book of Mormon. There he repeated the important injunction previously cited, but with this one very significant addition. He said, I would that ye be perfect even as I or your father who in heaven is perfect. Now, in, in the Book of Mormon, they're quoting that verse that you might hear in the Book of Matthew at the, uh, at the Sermon on the Mount. And what their prophet or their apostle is saying is, before Jesus said, just be perfect as God is perfect, or your Father is perfect, but then in the Book of Mormon, he said, you need to be perfect as I am perfect. And this is after the resurrection. So what he here is Jesus wasn't perfect in the beginning when he first came, but he did everything perfectly and then he became God. And so he continues on and he says that the prophet says this, and he says, This time he listed himself along with the Father as a perfect personage, personage previously he had not. And so this is what the LDS Church believes. The LDS Church believes that Jesus was a man created just like us and he attained perfection and because of that he became God. Now that is strikingly different from what biblical Christianity believes. In biblical Christianity we believe that Jesus was God who became man. This is what it says in John 1. In John 1 it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Now, let me explain something about this passage right now. When John, when he wrote this, he was using the word word to symbolize Jesus. And so if we replace Jesus for the word word in that, this is what it, this is what it reads. In the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, God the Father. And Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. And Jesus became flesh. Dwelt among us. So there's a striking difference in what Mormonism believes that God was man, or Jesus was man who became God, and what biblical Christianity believes that Jesus was God and is God and became man, fully God and fully man. Another LDS doctrine that's important for us to understand is that the, the LDS doctrine is the same way, excuse me. That I lost my point. Just a second. If here it is. In the same way that Jesus became God, that we can too. Okay? Let me say that again because I saw faces go like this. In the same way that Jesus became God, we can too. This is what Brigham Young says. How many gods are there? I do not know. But there was never a time where there were There is a, um, there's an expert on, there's a, there's an evangelical expert on Mormonism who said that Mormonism may be the most polytheistic religion out there. And in fact, in the same way that Jesus became God, according to Mormon theology, that's how they believe God the Father was before. They actually believe that God the Father was a human being. And he lived according to all the laws and ordinances of that world. So he was 
wife were exalted to godhood, and they've been making spirit children, and some of them get to be here on earth, and if we live according to all the laws and ordinances of their religion, then we too can be exalted to godhood. That's what happened to Jesus according to Mormon theology, and that's what can happen to us. And if you don't believe me, this is what Lorenzo Snow, one of their prophets, said. As man is now, God once was. So let's break that down. As man is, God once was. So we are human beings. God was once a human being. And as God is now, we may become. Okay? So as man is now, God once was. As God now is, man may be. And so when you hear that, that just breaks the entire paradigm of what biblical Christianity is, doesn't it? Nowhere in Scripture does it say that we will one day become gods. In fact, when Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, the sin that they committed was to think that they could become gods, knowing God. This is what LDS doctrine clearly states. That in the same way that Jesus was perfected, that we can too if we only work hard enough. But this is what biblical Christianity says. Biblical Christianity believes that Jesus and Jesus alone, what was, is, and will be God. Right? So we believe in the Trinity. One God. Three persons, each person fully God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this is what it says about Jesus. And I already read this passage, but it talks about Jesus in the beginning. Before all of creation, Jesus was God. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We also realize that when Jesus was here on earth, that Jesus was God too. Why? Because Thomas himself, after the resurrection, saw Jesus, and what was his response? He said, my Lord and my God. And then afterwards, when we have all ascended into heaven and we stand before God, we are not going to be exalted to Godhood ourselves, but we are going to be bowing our knees to whom? To Jesus. This is what it says in Philippians 2. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so that is one of the striking differences between our, our Mormon friends and their doctrine and biblical Christianity and our doctrine. And so what's the significance of this? You say, Josh, okay, so Jesus was a man who became God versus Jesus was God who became man. What's the difference? There's huge difference. Because no person can save you from your sin. Only God can do that. You see, Jesus being only God, God before all time, he created the world, he sustains the world, and he can save the world. Only because he is God. No human being can do what Jesus did. Only a person who is fully God and fully man can do what he did. But we so we talked about uh, the person of God. Now I want to move on to the work of what Jesus did. You see, Jesus did work, and, and so we, we asked the question, what did Jesus do on our behalf? This is a question of salvation. And in the LDS church, they have six different salvations. I don't know if you know this, but they have six different salvations. So there's an entire list. Of, of the salvations that they believe in. Number one, they believe in a salvation from death. They believe in a salvation from sin. They believe in a salvation by being born again. They believe in a salvation from ignorance, a salvation from se second death, and a, and a salvation to exaltation. That means becoming gods. And that is the sixth salvation. Of all of these salvations, Jesus only fully satisfies one and helps you partially partially with another. 
There are six salvations, and Jesus only kind of helps you along the way. The only salvation that he fully helps you on is your resurrection. Okay? That means that Jesus died, and just like Jesus died and rose again, I know this is getting a little heavy, but just follow with me. Just like Jesus died and rose again because he did that, we will too. But so will people who don't go to heaven. It's just universal, like everyone's going to rise from the dead to be judged. That's the only thing that Jesus fully helps you for. Jesus also partially helps you for your salvation from sin, but only after all that you can do. This is what 2 Nephi 25, 23 says, For by grace you are saved after all.
That's Romans 3.20. And so when we hear that, we're convicted of the fact of, man, I think I, I'm a pretty good person. And so God's going to see me, and I'm going to go before him. He's like, oh, Josh is good enough. Let's, let's let him in. But the reality is every time I sin, that's not just a crime to be punished, uh, a crime to be punished, but that's also a debt to be paid. You see, in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, they talk of as sin as debt. And every time you sin, you owe God. I don't know if you've ever owed anybody or someone has owed you, and, you know, you see that person, uh, you know, I, I know that there have been times when I've owed people, and I try not to do that, but there have been times, and so I've gone to them, I've seen them at a party, or I see them, and it's like, oh, there they are. I know I owe them money. I don't know if I want to see them or not, right? And, and you do that, but every time that we sin, and uh, let's, let's take my example, I mean, let's say I'm an average Christian, and let's say I'm a super Christian, I only sin, I don't know, once a day or once a week. I, I don't know what the, what the barometer for that is, but I sin against God and I know it. I hurt God and I know it. And every time that happens, I owe God something. And so when I go before the Lord, if it's, if it's just me, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. I go before God and that sh same shame that I had only my friend, I will have times So when God will look at my account and he looks at me, he's like, wow, you're a pretty righteous guy. And I'll be like, yep, just let me in, right? <laughs> because of what Jesus did. He no longer sees me as enemy. He no longer sees me as someone in debtor's prison. But he sees me as a child of God fully because of what Jesus did. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it is by grace
she's conscious about her, her accent. Um, on the way over here, she said, um, make sure people clean out their ears because there's no subtitles to this. <laughs> <laughs> so she is, um, but you'll be able to hear her. She, she's a great speaker. Um, she has a communications degree. Um, but Layla. Um, Layla, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your story of um, your briefly your time in Mexico and then how you came to the, the LDS church and in your experience in that. Hola, again. <laughs> Uh, my name is Leila Anderson, and uh, I'm from Mexico, Veracruz, Mexico, and yo hablo español, and uh, this is Josh, my husband. Uh, I have three kids, David, who is 11, Mia, who is eight, and we have a super cute baby. He's eight months. His name is Caleb. Um, I'm, like I say, I'm from Mexico, and uh, I grew up in the Catholic Church. When I was about 18, 19 years old, my parents um, were getting divorced. Somehow, uh, they, they uh, started going to the Mormon church. They became uh, LDS, Mormons, and um, they got baptized in the Mormon church. They got sealed at the temple. And then just probably about 10 months after that, I uh, joined the Mormon church in Mexico. Um, about a year and a half after that, I met Andy. Andy is my late husband. Uh, he was an LDS uh, missionary in Mexico. Uh, we dated about a year, and then uh, we got married in the Salt Lake City, Utah Temple, the big, pretty temple in Utah. Um, I was Mormon for 12 years, probably around 12 years, and uh, I was a really good Mormon. I was a hardcore Mormon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I served in the Mormon church. Well, I call it serve now, but uh, I had a calling, and what it is is like, you know, the bishop calls you one day and it's like, you're going to be doing this at the church. And you just have to smile and say, okay, I'll do it. And you have like, around, you can have several callings, three, four callings. Why, and, why do you uh, have to just smile and do it? Well, because you know that it's part of all the work that you have to do in order to, well, the Mormon church believes that there are several <laughs> levels of heaven. Uh, they, they have different names for them. And according to what you do here on earth, you can get, you know, in one of those levels of heaven. So if you want to be here, then you have to work pretty hard, right? So I, I you know, had all these callings. I uh, went to the temple once a week. In order to go to the temple, you need this temple recommendation. That's what they call it. And uh, in order to get that one, you need to do a pretty long list, you know, to be able to go to the temple and be worthy. You need to wear like undergarments uh, all the way to your knees, all the way here, 24-7. Uh, uh, you need to um, serve. You need to be, uh, you know, can't have coffee. You have to uh, just I tie, tithing. Yeah, you yeah, have to pay your tithing. You have to fast once a month. Yeah. In order to be able to go to the temple. Uh, at the temple, we, well, I did a lot of work for the dead people. That's what you do. You get baptized for people who died. Uh, you get married for people who died. And you do a lot of work for dead people. So I, I did that for 12 years. And there's a theology behind mm -hmm. that. But yeah. talk a little bit about the pressure that you felt, um, the perfectionism in the Mormon church. Um, and, and with all respect to the Mormon, but just you personally, how you yeah. felt about yeah. that. Um, I mean, when I was LDS, I didn't really realize that there was any, any other option. I just felt like I had to do all of these things. Um, my late husband, Andy, uh, well, it wasn't until he, you know, he was diagnosed with cancer on uh, two weeks before Christmas of 2013. So uh, we knew, you know, we found out he, he was a pretty bad, you know, cancer, terminal cancer. And it was until then when I, like, started like panicking like we only have this much time for you know to make sure that he's saved like to make sure that he goes to heaven so it was and your idea of saved is making sure he does all the right things yes yeah so you know we were working through that while he was sick just making sure you know he he will go to heaven uh, he passed away on uh, September of 2015 and I, you know, became a widow with two little kids. And then I started questioning myself, like, 
where is he? Is he in the highest level of heaven? I'm pretty sure he is because, you know, that's what I was thinking. Because he was really, really, a really good Mormon. And he was a great dad and a great husband. So I started, like, questioning and, and like, stressing out about, like, if I die today, where am I going to go? Because he was great, and I am not that good, you know? So I still have so much work to do to catch she up with great. him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was just really worried and always thinking, like, if I die today, like, am I going to be able to see him again? Like, am I able to, like, you know, like, catch up where, where he's at? If my kids one day die, like, are they going to be with him or with me, you know, in this level of heaven? So all these questions, like, started coming to me. Um, so the ulti- because the ultimate goal is exaltation, now they may not tell you this in the LDS church, but it is to become God. The, the terminology they use is that families are correct, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I decided to become Mormon, because they teach you that families are eternal. And when you die, you spend eternity with your family, married to your husband, and you become gods. And I mean, you, who doesn't want to be with their family forever, right? So that's why I joined the Mormon Church. Right. So, and then uh, when, when after Andy died, I just you know had all these questions, and I would go to church and just like, man, like something is off here. Um, then, uh, well, when Andy was sick, we were struggling financially. Uh, he stopped working because of cancer. I was his only caregiver, so I stopped working too. And uh, I had a blog. Uh, it was pretty much a Mormon blog. And uh, I had a big, you know, followers. And I put a financial uh, post over there, and I say, we need help. Like, whoever can help us pay a bill, like, we just, I'm, I'm desperate, like, I need help. Um, Andy used to play soccer, and Josh played with Andy in the same team. Uh, when I put that post on my blog, Josh and his brother reached out to Andy and me, and they were like, we want to help. So they pay a, a, very, a very significant bill, which I was grateful for. I never spoke to Josh during that time again, but when Andy died, I uh, reached out to everyone who helped us. And I sent a, a text to him and his brother, and I said, hey, thank you for what you guys did. I appreciate it. And then they were like, is there anything else that we can do for you? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have Andy's car, and I, I was wondering if you guys can help me like sell the car. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, so they helped me uh, selling the car, and that you started like, conversations you know, about the car, about the car. And then one day, I'm like, I, I know you're a pastor, like that's the only thing I know about you, but like, you know, tell me, tell me what you guys believe, you know? Yeah, and, and pause here for a second. On the front end of, of, of us getting to know each other, she was like, just so you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a widow, I'm not looking for a relationship. And I said, well, thank you, and I'm a biblical Christian, and, and I know that you're LDS, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm not interested in, in dating someone who's LDS, but I mean, if you ever want to have those conversations, that's fine. I think putting that line of demarcation up allowed us to just be friends without any of that pressure. And, and in, a, in, the, in that, I mean, there were just what, what I would call divine appointment conversations. Like, I remember this one time, um, she was uh, she was texting me on a, on a Saturday as I was, you know, putting the finishing touches on a, um, on a message that I was doing. And, and she said, what, what are you talking about um, tomorrow? And I said, uh, you know, the divinity of Jesus or the how Jesus is God. Like, tell me one place where Jesus says he's God. And so I'm like, I just went through a whole bunch of the passages that I just shared with you. And she's like, I had no idea because the Mormon church never talks about that. And so, yeah, one question I have for you is what did, when you were in the LDS church, what did um, the Mormon church teach about Jesus to, to congregants like you? Yeah, so you, you know that Jesus died on the cross. You don't know that he died for you, like you don't, you don't, you just don't, right? Like you talk a lot about uh, Joseph Smith and Heavenly Father. They believe that Heavenly Father is one person and Jesus is completely a different person, and then the Holy Spirit is totally like separated from so from them. Three yeah, three separate gods. So, uh, I mean, you you know the the story of Jesus. 
but it's not relevant. Like it's n it's not who saves you. You know, it's Heavenly Father and all the stuff that you do. Joseph. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as we were um, as we were sharing in dialogue, tell me about how your relationship with God grew. What you learned about Jesus. What was that encounter with Jesus yeah. like when when um, I got to trace and just lean in some of that? But he was actually having a conversation with you. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. So you know, we kept talking, and I say, Do you happen to have a Bible? And he's like, oh, yeah. And he went to the store and got me a Bible the same day. <laughs> I know, yeah. So he, <laughs> he brought it. And, uh, and I'm like, how do I read this thing? You know, because we, we just read uh, the Book of Mormon. We, we used to, I mean, we, you have a Bible at the Mormon Church, but you're all, all, uh, always reading the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> so uh, he got me a Bible. And he's like, just, you know, you can start. Uh, yeah, the Book of John. And so he left. And I opened the Bible. And I started reading. And the first thing that I read in the Bible was a story about a widow. And Jesus was crying with this widow. He wept with her. And I, I remember I was in my room, and I, I started just crying and just realizing and amazed that God was right there with me, that Jesus was crying with me, that he didn't care of if I, you know, do my callings, if I go to the temple, if I do this, if I do that, like, even though in the darkest times of my life, he was right there next to me. He didn't ask for anything from me besides loving him. And I just realized that that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to follow Jesus. And I, you know, I left the Mormon church right after that, and so. You said you, you made a decision for Jesus, and in that process, you also felt the Lord leading you shortly thereafter to leave the Mormon church. Yeah. And that was in early 2016. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some stories that we don't have time to share, but, but even David in his own miraculous way chose, chose yeah. Jesus and Mia also. Um, tell us a little bit about how your life has changed, how your perspective has changed. I drink a lot of coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> he makes me coffee every morning. <laughs> I was sharing before that when the kids met him, we were all LDS, and they were like, he's drinking coffee, and I'm like, I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of that. But uh, I, <laughs> it, it, was, it was like freedom. Like I felt when I received Jesus, when I realized that I didn't need to do all these things to go to heaven, like it was a huge weight like out of my chest. And I, I literally felt like a veil was just like pulled out of my eyes. And I started just realizing that there is nothing, nothing that I can do or that cannot do that will like stop me from going to heaven, you know? So, um, I mean, it hasn't all been easy. Actually, like, leaving the Mormon church and receiving Jesus, like, um, it's, been, it's been a process. I feel like God, like, slowly has been re just revealing things to me, things that I need to work on. I uh, joined uh, Celebrate Recovery at the church. I finished a 12-step program. Uh, just slowly, like, things, you know, that I feel like God is showing me that my life was not perfect, that I was not perfect, like, I, you know, how I believed. And the so. beauty of that brokenness is, and we all go through that brokenness, and um, is that as you navigate those, those the, the issues, as, as we navigate the issues in our own lives, that we still have the faith and the assurance and the rest and the freedom that what we're working Whatever that, that struggle is, whatever that habit is, whatever that, that, that sin issue is in our life, that it's not something that's going to tear us from our relationship. 
And uh, one, one thing that I want to add is like, I love the Mormon community. Like my sister, she's Mormon and she's my best friend, right? Uh, her husband, my nephew, my niece, my ex-in-laws, my kids have friends who are LDS. Like I love the Mormon community. And one thing that I do, you know, it's like I can't judge them. I just pray for them. I just show Jesus through my example, through the kids, through the love that I have for Jesus. And I know that there is so many of them out there, like me, who are just waiting to hear for the true Jesus. So. Give them both a hand. Thank you, guys.